So there's actually a theological reason why there would be less emphasis in the Greek on what type of sin, uh, what type of sin is being committed. And that's, be, that's Pauline theology straight through. Paul's view is, and this trickles right into um, mainline Christianity, and that is all sin separates you from God. And from the smallest sin to the greatest sin, uh, sin damns the soul. And there's no salvation. There's no way out. There's no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. Uh, Paul terribly misquotes Deuteronomy and and says says that uh, misquotes it to say that cursed is all all those who sin, and it actually doesn't say that. So in Christian theology, sin is an inescapable result of original sin. Man is born with this infection, and there is no way to escape it. That's the default baseline without the blood of Jesus. The moment the Christian Bible or Christian theologians would start to parse out sin into what was intent, what is the intention, um, what type of sin was this, so that would diminish from the core tenet of the Christian religion. In Tanakh, there's, of course, different kinds of sin. Moreover, in every society there is. In Malaysia, if you break a law unwilling, unwillfully or do it or, com- or commit a crime intentionally, there's really a very big difference in what the punishment is going to be, right? In any society, and where did they get this from? It all comes in the Torah. It's a principle it's, a, it's in the Latin word, it's called mens rea. Mens rea means the guilty mind, or what is the status of the mind of the person who commits a sin? Did you intend to commit the sin, not intend to commit the sin? Was it uh, accidental? Was it just being careless? Was it intent to the point that you just wanted something? Did you do it because you wanted to rebel against God? Well, that's the worst possible kind of sin. So therefore, in Tanakh, there is enormous variance because the consequences are staggering. In fact, we have one kind of offering called an asham, a guilt offering. And this is in Leviticus 5 or 6, depending on if you have a Jewish or Christian Bible. And there's even a distinction if even if the type of sin is the same, meaning intentional or unintentional, but the person then confesses their sin without being caught. So then you weaken or diminish the original weight of the sin. Paul doesn't want any part of this. And for those who are not familiar with the Christian Bible, the Gospels do not have a lot of theology in them. What the Gospels are is stories about Jesus' life, death, and uh, alleged resurrection. It's Paul's letters that contain most of the theology of the church. And in fact, Paul's letters almost has no sayings of Jesus, almost nothing about his life and what he said during his ministry, almost nothing. But there are very rare ex- exceptions. Uh, Paul's not interested in it, and he wasn't around, so he didn't know it, so what is he going to talk about? So you have this tremendous diversity between the the Gospels and Paul's letters, the just the content. So Paul's letters conveys that all sin damns the soul. And you shouldn't even think about what the Torah is speaking about, that there's a difference. Why? Because if there is a weaker form of sin for which a person can atone by repenting, as the people of Nineveh did, then what do you need Jesus for? You know, it's like if you want to, it's like if I go to a very cold region, if I go to um, Northern Europe during the winter and I want to sell them ice, I'm going to have a very hard time. I'll have a very hard time selling snowballs to the Eskimos because they'll say we ha- it's everywhere. It's completely accessible. So if you convince people that they're sinners and there's nothing you can do to save yourself, and 
if you, the viewer, find what I'm saying odd, strange, that means you've never been to church in your life. Because this is what is preached every Sunday and in almost every Bible class. This is standard fare. You can't save yourself. We're all sinners. We all fall short of God's glory. Read Romans chapter 3. This is because what Paul is doing is he's creating a necessity that doesn't exist. He's saying you need something, but the Torah says you don't need that. You could turn back to God after confessing your sin, promise to uh, be faithful to God, and God will forgive you for all your transgressions. What do you need Jesus for? To create the need, Paul infuses really utterly pagan ideas. Now, it's true there is a sin offering for unintentional sins or certain intentional sins if a person admits it before even being questioned about it. That's, a, that's, that's the asham of Leviticus 5 and 6. Otherwise, there's no sacrifice for sin. I mean, why would you, what did the animal do? If it's unintentional, so then the offering uh, provides a, uh, a closeness to God. You know, in Indonesian, and probably it's in Malay, the word for sacrifice is something like karban, right? Um, I know that's in Indonesian. That's a Hebrew word. And it means in Hebrew to come close. <laughs> There's nothing like that in Christian theology. And when Hosea says, let us render for bulls the offering of our lips in chapter 14, verse 1, 2, and 3, and he's speaking to the northern kingdom that doesn't have access to the temple, the, the church ignores that. So the reason why you don't have all these different words and any kind of any kind of stipulation for weaker sins, for unintentional sins, for non-rebellious sins, is because it is to the advantage of the person who invented Christian theology that you don't think about that. Rather, you think all sin is the same. And you, there, if all sin is the same, if committing adultery and thinking about adultery is all the same, and that's the Sermon of the Mount, right? That's Matthew chapter 5. If you think about another woman, even if you say, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to follow, you are already committed adultery. That is, t so Christians go, oh, well, then I'm, I'm finished. You know, you might not commit adultery in your life, but a person certainly is going to think about it, and then... Christians are utterly convinced that they're bad people, sinful creatures, for which there is no hope outside the blood of the, of the blood of Calvary. And that's why the New Testament and the Greek of the New Testament is not interested in, in, um, in, in setting this apart. It doesn't want to do that. It wants to say, it's all, all sin damns the soul. Nothing I'm saying is foreign to the ear of a Christian.